Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Aziri Plays A Case of Distrust. So, we're gonna go to the police station in this episode. So, what's the news on Green? Frankie asked as I was headed up the stairs. Now it seemed like I had all the details. I summarised it for him, so the total wrap. Green isn't green at all. He's Bregg, the jester, a former member of Egan's Rats from St. Louis. He's Bregg? Frankie asked Sean. But he's been here a while, Malone. Sure, I said. But only since 1920. He couldn't pay off his debts in Missouri, so he faked his death and moved to San Francisco. He's been longing to go back, and he needs a way to settle his score before he can show his face again. Is that why the speed licking comes from? Frankie asked. Uh huh. Green set up a shame scam rum. Green set up a scam rum running scheme. Ugh, that was a mouthful. He bought local wine, but claimed to get it at lower prices from Canada. He convinced Tiny Paul to front him a heap of cash for it. Instead of providing the wine, he's planning to skip town with Paul's money and disappearing to St. Louis with enough dough to pay back his debts. He already faked his death once, so he'll do it again here? Frankie asked. That's right. His plan is similar to his last one. Hire a detective, claiming he's scared for his life, fake his death, and then know the police won't bother with the underground violence. Frankie looked at me with a blank stare. Seems like all the pieces fit, he said, but he's just hired you as cover. I said, seems like it. Don't worry about that, Frankie started saying, but I cut him off. I want to see Shipman now. I'll sweep away this mess, but then come back and see you. Have a stiff drink ready, I instructed. Be careful, Malone. Egan's rats have a reputation, they can't be ruthless. I turned and walked up the stairs. There was only one place to go, the police station. Green had hired me to cover so that he could blow town. Shipman held the final evidence to sink that plan. I needed to get to the station. We'll have a taxi talk, I think. I stepped into the taxi and seemed with my own thoughts and thought about the case. Or maybe not, we won't have one. I'd finally caught my break and it was a dud. I hadn't realised it and we've been re revelling in real detective work. Once I learnt it all was punk, my mind reverted to its incessant nagging. I wondered if I was just a muppet to some two-bit mobster. I was hardly bringing much justice to anybody, which made me unsure of what exactly it was that I was doing. I supposed I was wasting my time. It all came back to me, the same basic premise. You're failing, my inner voice said. I began to feel nauseous in the car while my repeated its last thought. You're failing. And then everything turned to black. As if someone had shut all the lights. My naked arms faded into view. They emitted a soft white glow. I waved them in front of me, leaving streaks in my vision. Between the streaks, it appeared in the distance. I could hardly see, but the object below the clarity came to me, and then I understood what it was. Lewis's great coat. I float I float towards it. I reached to grab the coat, which was when I saw the needles. No, not needles. Glass, shards falling all around me. One piece wedged itself deep into my right elbow. I grimaced, but I was unable to make any noise or movements. But then, as suddenly as the rain had started, it stopped. I looked upward with caution, wary of the rain's return, but above me, I saw the grey coat. It was no longer billowing. It was rigid, a shield against the terrible rain. It started falling slowly at first, and then quickly it gained speed, and it came upon me and envelo enveloped, enveloped me completely. It was suffocating. I couldn't breathe. I let out a gasp. And then the light. It pierced my eye sockets, hitting the back of my skull, like a hammer of an anvil. <clears throat> I 
directed all my energy into my lungs and forced out a yell. That helped. Everything became quiet. I could breathe deeply. I noticed someone beside me. He gradually came into focus. Shipman showed me his teeth in, in a big smile. I looked at him from a lying position on the Murphy bed. He swung his legs over chair and sat beside me. I thought you'd never come around. I tried to ask him something, but another bolt of pain raced up my elbow. All I managed was a groan. Relax, PC. Oh, no, he had a poshy kind of voice than me. Relax, PC. Just a few scratches. Quite the auto crash. Flew straight through the front window. They took out a large piece of glass from your right arm. I remembered none of that. I mumbled the words, auto crash to myself. I wondered how bad the incident must have been. Shipman removed the flask from his pocket, unscrewed the top and handed it to me. Not the best hooch, but it might get rid of that bang in your head. I took a swig. I closed my eyes and sighed a deep breath as, it, as, as the its warmth burned out my throat. I knew modern medicine doubts it, but that gulp of moonshine helped. I went to give the flask back to shipment, but he put a hand out to stop me. Hang on to it. Might need another swig after what I'm about to tell you. I propped myself up and on my left shoulder to listen. About Green's case, the two of us figured he was going to fake his own death. Shipman clicked his tongue to his teeth and looked towards the floor. That ain't happening. Last night, Connor Green was shot through the heart twice. What? I shouted. The exclamation was impulsive. I swung my legs quickly and sat on the edge of the bed. My headache had suddenly vanished. Whoa there, said Chipman. Look. Been here with you all night, he added quickly, in that chair beside the bed. Just telephoned the station to check in, and that's the rap they gave me. Told them that what I'd known from you, and they said they'd chase it up. How do you know it was him? Another involuntary question. I was running on instinct. PC, faking his death involves a mangled body. Shot through the chest, his face is still intact. Whatever Green was planning on doing, he didn't get that far. And we'll look it up, and he doesn't have a twin. And we looked it up, and he doesn't have a twin. That would be way too easy, Shipman grinned. Green hired you for this case, he continued. Gives you every right to follow it up if you want. That said, he was likely talking to you, he was likely taking you for a ride. Wouldn't blame you if you wanted to drop it. But I'd like your help, you see. You know the case. Could use your head. Even if it was even if it was even if it's been a little bumped. Once you're feeling better, I'll be at the station. Come find me. Shipman stood up and cracked his back. Maybe I'll catch some shut eye on the top of my desk too. She'll beat that chair you got. He turned and walked out. Whoa! When you just had a car crash, what the fuck? <laughs> That's kind of came out of nowhere. Um, for headphone users. Uh, I stood up from the creaking bed and surveyed the cluttered apartment. The apartment was already cramped when the Murphy bed was up. And with it down, I could barely squeeze through the living room. Can I excuse you? The cat slept at the foot of the bed. I scratched behind the ceiling and seemed to like that. Uh, Newspaper, statue. Okay, let's leave. I stared at the doorway and took a deep breath. I suppose I owed Chipman enough to sol help solve the case, even if Green, even if Green had given me the runaround. After all, what type of detective would leave a case half solved? Although Green had just been using me, his life had apparently been in danger all along. I resolved to find his killer. I headed, uh, I headed to the North Beach station for any information shipment could give me before starting the chase. Okay, police station though. I hailed the driver, gave him the address and stepped into the back door. I debated talking to the driver. 
I was going to talk to the taxi person, but then all that drama happened, so I peered out the window until he arrived. Um, the headquarters, the headquarters, the headquarter buildings, there, I can't even say it. The headquarters buildings dominate in the corner of Canary and Washington in Chinatown. Rebuilt after the 1906 earthquake, I thought it would look more sour than it had before. I slipped out of the taxi cab and walked through the station doors, ready to chase any leads on Green. But standing in front of me, as I entered, bawling her eyes out from the, her sockets was Mrs. Green. She saw me and bought her, way, bought her waiting closer. Oh, God. I'm alone. She exhaled through her sobbing. You're one for my husband. What happened? Her breathing obscured her next sentences, but I got the general idea. I told her I knew as little about the matter as she did, but I was looking into it, and I was sure the officers were doing their best. She begged me to help them, again drowning most of her sentences with her sobbing. I promised I would try. She took a slow inhale, raised the chest, and walked out of the station. When she was outside, Fred Grant came around the corner and let out a snort. Grant was another investigator for the SFPD. I studied his ruddy face, strewn with broken capillaries that gave the impression of a map of streams. The cigar often poked out of his mouth, hardening his jaw and twisting his face into a scowl. I suppose that was appropriate. That was an appropriate look for a man who enjoyed his bribes in liquid form. Grant has never been a sport of policewomen, and he was no fan of mine. He lighted a cigar and said, The widow seems pretty torn up about him. You really helping her out? I said I was, and he gave me another snort. Figures she'd go to you after we told her no. <laughs> I raised the questioning eyebrow. Look, last thing I gotta do is head to the tin spoon. That's then this is going in the freezer. That meant he was about to close the case cold. You aren't chasing it up, I asked. He looked appalled that I would have even asked. I've got more to deal with than some dead gangsters. The captain don't care about crap like this. So long, it's not spreading too far. And what about the girl? <laughs> what do you expect, he asked. This broad, uh, this brood goes and marries an Irish man. <laughs> probably killed one of you, one of his own or some dago, all those bums run together. I gave him a frown to which he responded, look, if the missus wants you to do this, that's her gamble, but this ain't gonna lead you nowhere. I don't expect any support from the boys. Not even if I find Green's killer. He laughed. If you get a confession, we'll cop him, but n nothing the DA can't, not something the DA can not something the DA thumb there, there. Why can I not do this today? Not something the DA can thump his nose at either. Gotta admit three things. Means how they killed Green. Opportunity. When they did it. Motivation. Why they bother. Why'd you do that? You. Why'd you do that? You do that. Then, sure. We'll be right behind you. But ain't nobody here looking into it, I promise. I pulled on a cap, he pulled on a cap and walked out. I really screwed up, my bad. Anyway, I heard a glare in Grant's direction and I was still fuming as I turned down the hallway towards Shipman's office. Shipman was frying up the stacks of paper at top of his desk and stood up and smiled when he saw me. Glad you made it. I asked him what he found about the case thus far, he laughed and mentioned that the paper stacks. Not in any way related to Green. Piled under the trash now, nobody's looking into Green's case here. I must have scowled a mean look at him because Shipman was quick to shake his head. Not that the, not that the case is dead, PC, but Captain has no one on it. Even Grant's coming off as soon as he can. We're underwater with other bunk. So you got nothing for me? Not true. The department will still do the regular foxtrot. He tossed me a beige folder, inside a large black and white French frock with Green's face. Muscles relaxed and his eyes closed. They looked almost normal, apart from his flattened hat behind his head and the dirt and grass behind it. 
the report behind fiction noted three important clues. First, that Green died at midnight the previous night. I cursed myself that I'd been so close to stopping it. Second, that Green was killed with two point four five caliber bullets to the chest. Those slugs weren't from a pea shooter. Green was killed by a mean gun. Finally, that Green was found this morning laying in Washington Square Park that was only a block away from the tin spoon. I noted each of those facts and gave the folder back to Shipman. All we got, Shipman said, laying the folder back on his desk. Can pinch the gunman if you can improve the case. But you got to solve it without much support. Don't have the time to help either, he said. No point coming back here until you've got your mail. At least I'm on the case, I said. That's good enough to leave me tickled pink. Ship Shipman laughed. But listen, we need a confession on this one. Captain don't want to run around. Right. I might mention that they'd have to admit to how, why, and when they when they killed Green. That's it. Prove that, and we'll pick him up, he said. Never been on a murder before, right? Can get tense, but just know. If you accuse someone, but can't prove everything, they'll turn like a switch. Might like you one minute, and hate you the next. Chatting with folks is the easiest route to get more information, but won't get any banter after you accuse someone of murder. So be careful who you accuse. Could make your case harder if you go the wrong way. All right, I get it, I said, and I internalised it. And remember, Shipman concluded, plenty of lies out there, but you can contradict means, motive or opportunity with anything in your notes. I thanked him and walked out of his office. Oh, snap. <laughs> I stood outside the police office and went over the mantra. I had to prove means, motive and opportunity for anyone I suspected of the murder. Once I found all three for a single person, I'd have them licked. I started to begin the chase. And before we begin the chase, we're going to cut, cut the episode because it's getting a bit long. But stay tuned for the next one where we will start to investigate one of the three locations except for Frankie's. Because we think Frankie's is like a goody two shoes, right? Well, it's not goody two shoes, but you know, he's a homeboy. But make sure you like and subscribe. And I'm really sorry if my reading skills are trash, but you know trying to get better at it so cut me some slack and i'll see you guys